computer and you can hit that button to say okay and then I'll go over to Facebook live and we'll go live and we'll start talking about how you grew up and got into comedy and all about your comedy and what you want to do the rest of your life. Right. It's no good. big deal. It's just that, that I try to make it fun and get people to know you, like you, and follow you. That's the whole point. All right. All right. That's good. Super duper, man. And then lately, I've been trying to do a good job of sending this out everywhere so it gets more views. It's just so hard getting views. I'm not famous yet <laughs> but i <laughs> tried <laughs> yeah hi guys it's linda marcus smith here be sure and follow and subscribe to my youtube if you will youtube.com backslash lynn smith 2476 don't ask me why the best i can do folks i know that you folks watch like wildfire after the videos air and that's cool no big deal let's get right to our today interview and he is somebody i know in real life he's a delight and he's a vegas comedian i'm going to try to read this interview uh intro without my glasses so let's watch the old lady squint right now ready okay jorge luis is a comedian actor and writer based out of las vegas He's been open micing in Vegas for the past five years and has featured in the infamous Shot Collar and Delirious Comedy Clubs. A rising voice in the Vegas comedy scene and with a simple but yet hectic belief that no matter what, the show must go on. I like that. He's old school. Let's get to know him right now, folks. He's sitting right over there in the little triangle. Triangle? No, it's a rectangle, lady. In <laughs> a rectangle. Jorge Luis, you guys. Woo! Hi. Hi, Linda. Hi. It's so great to see you. You're in Vegas today. I am. It's a hot one again, and we're just living it up here. I'm here in my, my padded cell, just <laughs> <laughs> enjoying the time. <laughs> yes, thank you for coming on. I want my people to get to know you like you, follow you, and help your career. So we're going to take some time to have them get to know you. So you need to open up and be real, authentic, and vulnerable. You know, you can cry if you want to, whatever it takes, you know? <laughs> you never know if AGT is listening, right, AGT? You like them backstories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's just have a trauma dumping session, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear it all. So tell folks that are not watching right now that are going to watch later, tell people, tell the masses who you were growing up in your family circle and in your school circle growing up. Were you funny? Were you shy? I find it fascinating to hear this. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, growing up, I was actually uh, pretty shy. I would say I still am pretty shy in a lot of ways, but... um. I've I've always had the performing bug in me from when I was a when I was a kid. So by the time I reached high school, I uh, decided to break out of my shell and actually uh, was involved for a theater my entire uh, high school, uh, like four years there, and uh, that was really cool. So I uh, I pushed to then uh, do it for college, but in college it just didn't have the same um, it didn't have the same uh, artistic. Uh, range that I guess I, I would say that I wanted. So by the time uh, I discovered a stand-up class that was going up at my college over at uh, CSN, uh, I tried it out and the, the freedom of just being able to write your own material, be the be the person that you, basically you actually are instead of taking up a character role. It was just, it was just so appealing, it was so freeing and uh, I, I just took to it like, like, like fire to paper. It was just, I just couldn't stop doing it at that point and so I started going to the actual open mics outside uh, uh, around Las Vegas. My first one being the one at the at the Science and Wonder. That was off of Sunset, so you'd have to... Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but 
you'd have to perform stand up while also the planes went by because it's right next to the now uh, Henry Reed Airport. <laughs> so it oh, doesn't get geez. doesn't you don't get a bigger heckler than Spirit Airlines. That's <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I once did 20 minutes outside my apartment complex and I videotaped it and every three minutes a plane went overhead. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, and you were shy and you got exposed to acting and then you said, you know what? I really like this thing as opposed to taking on a character. I really like being myself. I find that fascinating. Yeah, because I was always, because I always, uh, I was always um, really prideful in my humor. Like it, it's the ultimate, uh, it's the ultimate driving force that I think keeps my life going in every aspect. Because uh, that's that's what it's about for me. Like for every good or bad thing that happens in anyone's life, I think that for me personally, it's always about getting to the next laugh, and it'll always be there. It'll always be there for for me if uh, if I just you know if I will it if I make it happen and I'm glad that I am able to put myself in positions where I do open myself to that type of joy. It's just great. It's a lot of fun. I love that. You know, I was thinking about acting at one point and I, I went to improv and I was like, this guy that was teaching, it was like a drill sergeant. I I was in the army. <laughs> and this guy had me crying in the bathroom. And I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I'm tough, you know, he was tough. Yeah. But and then trying to be an actress where I have to be something I'm not. I just like being on stage. I got enough problems trying to be who I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, high school high school theater will give you identity issues. It does. It will. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm so glad you're willing to talk about that because I have personally, I know this is all about me today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When I when I see comedians go on stage and they have acting and improv background, I think they struggle with being themselves. Oh, is yeah. that right? I I usually tend to feel that it's the uh, oh well, not the opposite effect, but I feel like a lot of the stand-up comedians would uh, at least the open micers would really benefit from being getting more involved into acting and improv. Just because I feel like most of the time what they struggle with is making their material not sound rehearsed. That it would really help them go. to sound. But, and the that's whole, the other uh, side of the coin. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's two... Like, if they come on as an actor and they're too much in a character or a persona and not enough material, you're like, oh, no, not another actor trying to be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I do think I do think that to myself sometimes. It's like, okay, this is but this is comedy. This isn't acting. <laughs> yeah, no, for a while it was it was tough to break out of it because like I because of my uh, acting and and uh, improv background, I, I I did feel like a fraud half the time when I was doing stand up. Even if even if I did good or even if I did good, sometimes it was hard to take the compliment because I was like, was I really myself up there though? Like, was I really? Like, I really just made these people buy in that I just thought about this thing, even though it's been material that I've rehearsed for a long time. Yeah, so now you're speaking to something else that I find fascinating, that we do have to act, because we do have to sell them that we feel a certain way, and that try. sometimes we're trying to make it like we just thought of it in the moment, or that we care about the audience, and sometimes we don't. There is a lot yeah. of acting to it, isn't there? There really is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting line to try to, to try to walk because if you lean into one more or the other, you, you risk like not being, not actually either being in the moment or not actually being able to relate to the audience right in front of you. Cause at the end of the day, it does have to feel like it's a natural conversation that you're having with one person, but just giving the illusion of that with a group of people in the same room. Wow. That was that was a real nugget you just dropped. Can you repeat that again for people? Because I want them to really hear what you just said about, to, you know, you're delivering it like you're saying it to one person, but your the whole room is hearing something. What did you just say? Yeah, that the that the magic that comes from stand-up, I feel, it tends to be come from the idea that you're 
having a conversation with one person, but you're giving the illusion that you're doing that with a group of people in the same room as you. Oh, so you're speaking to the conversational element. Right, and yeah. A lot of times, stand-up comics of old were all about set-up punch, and they weren't having any kind of conversation with anybody. They were just memorizing and regurgitating, which is kind of what I get dinged for. I come from the old school style of comedy, and I'm trying to transition into, <laughs> into uh, being more conversational. So have you ever had difficulty going from telling your jokes to re be making it conversational? And what tips do you have for that? Oh, yeah, all the time. I, I, th I think it's constantly what I'm measuring myself against because uh, that's the biggest difference between acting and stand-up comedy, I think, that, uh, that, that helps me fight, figure it out is that am I performing a monologue or am I actually having a conversation? Wow. And usually, usually if I'm leaning more towards the conversation, even if it feels weird that you're trying to have the one conversation with a group of people, <laughs> giving the illusion that it's with one person um it's always going to be the the meet the deciding factor if are you in the moment with this audience that you're with right now and do they believe it and i don't know how if there really are any tips that i can give to do that because it really just is something that kind of just gets ironed out the more you just go to open mics the more you just do that stage time the more you fail at doing it is when it what step closer to being better at it and I, I guess that would be where the discipline comes in with stand up is that that's that a lot of people aren't willing to do that, that they want to be funny. They want to be liked uh, by those people. But that 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 I feel failure there is going to constantly be there. And it's and it's hard to it's hard to ever want to get to to do it if uh, if you're not, you know, looking for that actual line of uh, don't worry about if it's going good or not. Are you talking to someone right there and then and what can you do from there? So where does talking to one person in a group in your mind versus um, doing crowd work? Like, do you do you go as far as doing crowd work with that or just in your mind, you're delivering it as though you're talking to one person? Um, when I'm writing it, when I'm writing it, when I'm performing it, I'm definitely doing it as if I'm talking to, uh, one person. Wow. So when I do it into crowd work, that makes it, since you're having the conversation with one person, it's kind of the baseline there at that point. Cause then if other people interject or anything, then it's like, we're straying a bit away from that conversation, but that's fun. That's that people like seeing behind the curtain and, and stand up in that type of way. Because then it's not just that that conversation. It's that like, look, I know we're all here in this room. And it's like that self awareness. Everyone has it. So uh, because they'll buy they'll buy into it either way because they're there to be entertained. That they're to have a good time. It's my job to entertain them in that sense. So even if it's a one on one conversation, everyone's included. I'm aware that everyone's included. We we're all aware of that and that makes it, I think, easier to be able to navigate through crowd work if we're just taking it one at a time. I love that. So tell me, you make you make comedy sound so easy because you've been doing it five <laughs> years and you, you come from, you know, acting and improv and into comedy. So you're well-rounded and well, well-versed in a lot of it. But tell... Tell the people, tell me some of the mistakes you've made that have helped you iron out the kinks. Because it's through the failures that we come become better. So I could take all day telling you my failures, but yeah, <laughs> not, it's not my day. It's your day. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see. I think uh, the, the parts I really fail with is that um, I, I, I used to be very, very desperate to get a laugh. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but you'll see a comedian that's just clearly like not okay with silence, like at all. Even if it's the setup for their joke, they're not supposed to laugh at the setup. But that silence is, it's its a lot, it's very loud and it's very vulnerable. And where that's where you should really like dwell in it, you should really stay in it because your setup, 
is everything. Like, it doesn't matter if I feel if you have a great punchline, a punchline is only is only going to be as good as its setup. Because if they don't understand what you're talking about, then what? Like, how are they gonna? How are they gonna relate to the setup? I mean, the punchline at all, in that sense. So really, take your time to be have that conversation portion of it before you're getting near pun punchline, is what I would say. Uh, that it, it'll it'll make a huge difference because I used to have a really a big problem with that silence that I was just rushing through my setups because I just I wanted to get to the laugh as quickly as I can. <laughs> yeah and uh it's true for one-liners too i i think people a lot of time when i talk about that they think i'm talking about story type of jokes but it, it goes for punchlines too if they can't hear or understand your one sentence setup it should be easy because it's like it's set up in punchline it should be that quick but if you're if they don't understand you then how are they going to possibly get your joke or where you're coming from i love that have you ever told a joke and the audience didn't know how you really felt about the topic? And then you went back and put the feel like some people get up there and they're delivering material without including how they feel about it. You know, like they're, they're, oh. so, they're busy writing a joke or a story. And they're like, if you watch Christopher Titus, for instance, or Lewis Black, they're famous ranters, but you definitely know how they feel about a topic. And then, you know, or Sebastian Maniscalco, but like, have you ever had that moment when you go, oh man, maybe I should put in how I really feel about this? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I've definitely felt that because I, I just, I just wanted to talk about the subject, but I realized what wasn't making a hit was that I wasn't inserting myself into it on where I stand about it. And because of that, be they, they didn't understand any of my train of thought of the statement. Wow. And, and uh, I, d I don't know, I don't really know how to fix that. It's either just try it again to see if that actually is the issue or go back, change something else, or even honestly, just come back with an emotion about it. Like, like some sometimes it's not just about saying it, it's about showing it with your with your face or your tone or everything. If yes. if you say that you're mad about something, um, and your voice is affected, like I hate when people uh, talk about the political climate that way. Like, <laughs> like, do you hate it? Do you actually hate it? Like, I'm guilty, then, guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I call it breathing life into it. You know, like you have to breathe the life into the words. So, like, you can say, you know. Um, I've been aging, you know, and they're like, yeah, and, and, but some, sometimes you can breathe life and go, so uh, I've been aging. <laughs> anybody, anybody getting older up in this bitch? <laughs> 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 now they know how I feel. I didn't have to say a bunch of words and like, it's really sucks getting old. I don't have to say that. They, I breathe life into it and they, they, they get it without words. Have you done that? I have, yeah, I have. It 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 works really well. Even sometimes when just when we speak on it, speaking on it nonchalantly is a is a stance on something, which yeah. is it's really cool. That's that's my favorite. If I can do it, if I can state something uh, very matter of factly and everything, that in itself is already just just giving an indicator of people of how I feel about the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like it's almost like the 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 politeness of it makes it makes it like. Oh, we're definitely avoiding a bigger subject here, but I'm glad that we're just we're just going <laughs> off on it. Like, like, it's like <laughs> you know what I noticed is that uh, people love it when I say the opposite of how I feel. <laughs> like I I went to so much trouble to be authentic, only to find out they like it when I say what I don't feel. Like, yeah, isn't it fun getting older? You know, they like. And that's not how I feel at all. And they know that, but they let me say the opposite. It's like, do you find yeah. that to be the case when you say the opposite? It really hits. It does, honestly. That's that's some of the that's one of the techniques I picked up from uh, from Don Barnhart, uh, who was a mentor for me. I, I took one of his classes before, but it was a really good writing tip that if like if the I hate isn't working or you've heard it before, or, like you feel like it's stale. Just change it to I love instead and find the material that way. It's it's 
even if it doesn't work, it's at least a new angle that no one's heard about before or that at least you challenges yourself to to sell it in that type of way. And yeah. it's it's much more interesting. It pops a bit more. It really works. It's the same for like in changing I love to I hate, like, you know, the unpopular opinion. It works. It works, too. Yeah. OK, so let me ask you this, since we're becoming close friends. Um, <laughs> who is your favorite comedian, living or deceased? Living or deceased? No, and, just and one. Like for, and for what aspect? Like for being a classy person on stage, my favorite is Rita Rudner. For twist jokes, uh, Wendy Liebman. For um, great writing, it would be Kathy Ladman. So that kind of response is what I'm looking for. Who's your favorite for what type of... For like zany, it would be... Um, uh george burns gracie allen i like her oh cool. zaniness so all right who, who uh, are your yeah i definitely I, I definitely have have a few comedians like that that fit a certain archetype or, or style that i i really enjoy um i would say for uh one of my favorites for uh talking about like vulnerability or or, or anything like that it'd be M maria bamford by far She's in incredible. Like I, I look up to her a lot. Like in the sense of just what it means to actually like be yourself, all the non pleasant things <laughs> included, and uh, just so, all the personality she gives into her into it and her material and everything. It's I I love her. She's great. She's fantastic. Um, for Zany and for someone who's like in, exceptionally good at like anticipating people's expectations and bringing a left turn to it um emo phillips i i he's a huge inspiration for me i love emo phillips uh i'll have to go his, watch his, him i've never watched him he he's a he's an oddball he's an oddball he has, he has like a little bob haircut he's almost like uh he, he was more prominent in the 80s but he but he's like a he was like a modern day uh court jester really he talks in a very high falsetto it's very odd it's I, I don't. I don't think anyone would dare to do anything the way he does. The only other person I've seen that did something that's similar was Kaufman. Yes, I, would I was say. thinking of Andy when you said said this. I thought Andy Kaufman. It sounds like an Andy Kaufman thing. Exactly. Yeah, and I and Andy Kaufman's great. He's one of the legends. But uh, Emo Phillips I, is my personal favorite for it, just because the way he writes. He definitely, even though he is selling this odd persona. He has a very good understanding of how people um, understand language and sentences and where they're going, and then just completely like either takes it more literal or takes it to a left turn. And and either way, it's it's incredible. I I tell his jokes, but I don't want to butcher him. I think I think you should definitely look up Emo Phillips for yourself because he's he's quite the quite the interesting character. I will do that the minute I get off of this interview. I will look him up and find out what I like about him too. Thank you. Well, okay, so you've you featured at, for Delirious, Don Barnhart's shows, and you've also done Shot Collar Comedy. What are the similarities between those two shows? Could it be more different? <laughs> the, the, it's really cool that there are such different formats for uh, comedy shows now, I think. It's, it's really awesome. Uh, Don Barnhart, uh, I think he gave me my first, my first real legitimate like comedy club experience. Really, really early when I got into it too. I think I may have been uh, about three or four months into open micing, and uh, and uh, Don Barhart let me go up uh, at Jokesters Comedy Club back when it was still at the D and everything, and he was running it, and that was a great experience. He let me go up uh, for a weekend. First night, I did great. I killed it. It was like one of the one of the highest best feelings I'd ever gotten at that moment, and then the following night absolutely bombed the worst i've ever bombed to this day it's the, i think about that night a lot it was that <laughs> bad it was that type of bombing where like people aren't even booing or heckling you they're just they're just silently watching you <laughs> waiting for you to finish talking and that's i think that is worse than being heckled or booed is just because i can remember almost every single one of those faces in the audience just looking at me some of them just like like with pity, some of them with just like confusion, and some of them just like like this. <laughs> I, I felt it all at once. That <laughs> it was, well, that, it was that brings brutal. up a really good topic. 
how can the same person kill one night and then the next night bomb? How is that? You know, like it does happen. What's you, what's what are some of your answers to that question? In my experience, um, I think that's what's so odd about it is that it really does feel like a phenomenon in that moment. Like, because at the moment, I couldn't comprehend it how I had bombed so badly after coming off such a high night at the same place with the same material. Thank you. And and uh, I think the bombing. I think I think it just happens a lot more quicker than we ever anticipate because those those first that first minute really does make the difference of if this audience is going to dig you or not. And at the time, I don't think I was ever experienced enough also to get out of the bomb because once I bombed, I just kept I just kept, again, here it is. I went into actor mode. I kept monologuing as if what was happening wasn't happening. And that disconnect from the audience was just like it was it was hard to come back from. Nowadays, I'm better at bombing. I, I would say that. that the pursuit for most comedians is should be to learn how to bomb because if you <laughs> if you know how to bomb you'll never actually ever bomb like wow. it's wow. it's really good like now it's like now i can acknowledge on stage actively when i am bombing and it's and it starts to get people back not always but it's a it's a it's giving yourself a fighting chance to like to like drown and get your and start kicking your feet to get back up even if it's for a little air until you get back to shore and it it really is just something that just comes from experience. Like, I, I wish I could have told myself that night because when I went home, I was I was so bummed. I was so upset. Yeah. If I could only tell myself that, well, you're only as good as you last performed, so just go up again. <laughs> just go up again. Yes. The absolutely. bomb is so temporary. No one will remember it. Only you. <laughs> so just take yeah, the, I take, have a take the I have lesson. A keep going. I have a coach in New York, Gladys Simon, and she says. Like, like if you bomb, she just tells you, no one gives a shit. Nobody's gonna remember. They really don't. <laughs> They're all they won't you know, they only care about themselves. What? They won't remember in 24 hours. <laughs> Most people just care about themselves, you know, like they're into their own material and they're not even gonna remember unless like, you know, you really, I don't know, did something like that Seinfeld character did <laughs> with the big hair. A couple in the like 20 years ago, he went on a racist rant on uh, Kramer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Kramer. If you do one of those, they'll <laughs> remember. But short of that, I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you did you ever listen to Dave Chappelle's bit about the, the Kramer incident? I would love to hear it. I got to look that up. What's that about? Oh, uh, if you look up Dave Chappelle Laugh Factory uh, Kramer. Uh, he he talks about it real briefly because he does because he's not really he's just going up to like uh, do more riffing than he is like material, and he just talks about how uh, like man every time I see that sign I just think about how Kramer fucked up <laughs> and it's and it's just good you you should watch the rest for yourself it's it's a really good time one of the funniest like off the cuff type uh, tangents ever it, and it's by Dave Chappelle one of the greats so. It's yeah. it's so good. It, like every Dave Chappelle fan probably knows about it, but if you don't, definitely look it up. It's really great. Well, who are some of the com comedy heroes you have that you've brushed elbows with in your five years? Uh, <laughs> Don Barnard is definitely one of them. He's 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 a comedian's comedians as it gets. Like he knows the business, and uh, he he just knows how to work a crowd. It's it, he makes it seem so effortless, and it's like. I, it's something I aspire to do as well, and especially because he's he's just he's very silly on stage. He's very goofy. I, I love it. Like yeah, you could definitely like you know jump into like those territories that people are like oh like PZ or whatever everything. But at the end of the day, it's it's still through this uh very like silly goofy character uh, persona, or that's just him. But it's it's great. It works really well. Um, yes. So he, he would be one of the greats. Um, I like the I, uh, bit. I like the bit he does about his spine and the L uh, losing his spine a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> There's a T-shirt for it now too. Of just the, the spine progression. It's so great. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great joke. Oh my gosh. I guess it's more uh, of a bit. Yeah, uh, Chris, Chris Shaw is also very am, am amazing. I I love watching him. He's incredible. When I when I talk about their comedians who are afraid to be in the the silence or to take it slow, 
not not Chris. He he. It's almost funnier when he almost isn't saying anything. When he's just like just just standing there and just staring for a bit. Like, it incredible. I don't know how he does it, and I'm fascinated by it every time I get to watch him perform. Yeah, he'll go up on stage and he'll go and he'll take the mic and he'll just go and he'll just like. And, and <laughs> take a few beats just to he says he doesn't know what he's going to do until he gets up there. Incredible. Amazing. <laughs> then, you know, that's that the takes... difference between talented people and, and, and writers. It's, it's, it's incredible. I just got to um, be around Shang. Um, in Hollywood, and he, I saw him go up, and uh, he must have done like an hour and a half, and it was like I thought I was at the Apollo, people hooping and hollering for an hour and a half, and and I got to thinking, I wonder how much of that was his regular tried and true material versus winging it and ad, ad libbing for the audience. You know, and that the crowd work was pretty specific to the people. And but maybe he had things in his pot. You know, and I said, how much of that did was just riffing? He said fifty percent. Incredible! I know. Amazing. Again, if that's the thing, if if you're having the one on one conversation, it's easier to just be able to branch off and uh, and you just utilize a whole crowd. You're building a. I forget who. I really wish I could remember who gave me this uh, this idea or the term for it. But they called it uh, building a village. Like uh, when you're up there, you, it, as long as you start with one person, then you can start bringing in other people, like from the audience, and uh, having those running bits between all of them. And since everyone's aware of them at the same time, it's like we're we're all being included in this in this group that's being created actively right in front of us. You know who that sounds like? Might have said that. Butch Bradley. Oh, Butch is amazing. I, it, I, I haven't had a personal conversation before, but I've seen him perform. He's, he's, he's also really great. He's incredible. Yeah. There's another guy that, who's the guy that's at LA Comedy Club a lot? A big guy in, in his t-shirt says Subway, like Subway. Is it uh, Kool-Aid, Axel, Axel Anzel? No, not him. Um, like Hispanic guy, and he does a lot of motivational comedy. I mean, almost every element has something where you're coming away with takeaways for your own life, like life hacks. Or he's he's at LA Comedy Club a lot, and I just admire the fact that not only is he you know up there making us laugh, telling jokes, working with the crowd, but he's also dropping knowledge, you know, of things how to make how to cope or make life better or how to get along with people. He's just incredible. He's the guy with the, the t-shirt that says yeah. Subway. Yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar. I just don't know off the top of my head. But I, God, I'd love to encounter them. That sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who, which guy it is now. I feel racist. <laughs> 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 it's nothing new. <laughs> Trust me. I... <laughs> I, I, you know, as an older person, you, people assume you're racist. Oh, are you not? <laughs> <laughs> am I not? The, am I not the minority of the month for you? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like I don't have a racist bone in my body. I'm gonna start getting racist if these people don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's enough with that. No, I got enough problems with my own group of people. You know, I think we should all just work on our own group of people. Because <laughs> I got so much on us Jewish people that, like, like I, I could go for days on making fun of my own group. <laughs> I was the time I got into comedy that I met more Jewish people. I, I, I feel like... Yeah. And the feeling that way, it's broken me out of my shell because I was like, wow, I didn't know that this was th this many Jewish jokes. <laughs> or or self hating Jews. That was a, that was something I I never had heard about a self hating Jew. What does that look like? And it turns out they're most of my favorite comedians. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Like you try being half Jewish, you know, and the wrong half is your dad, not your mom. I was like, oh man, I could go for days with the jokes, but now's not the 
particular year for Jewish comedy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people assume that that means I have a certain stance on Israel. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't have, I'm not a political person. I'm not even Jewish. So the Jews don't think I, anyway, this got off onto me. How did that happen? Am I a narcissist? <laughs> It's the Jew. It's the Jewiness. It's just I can't just say Jew without being like, oh, let me tell you. Boy, I have my god problems. Let me just share a few. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so what are some things about your own people that you have you done comedy about your own people, or do you stay away from that? I think uh I don't think I have a choice whether it's about my people or not. Just because I am that people, like it's always going to come back to that. But I, I, I try not to dwell too too much on it because there's personally for me there's not that much interesting about being uh, bilingual in that sense. Um, and it was never never really too much of an issue for me growing up or anything. I, I'm pretty secure in how Latino I am, but uh, I I do like to involve myself in uh, uh, Latino centric. Uh, uh, events or anything if i can just because i like i am part of that background and if even if i'm not the stereotype version of it um i just like participating because i feel at home at it <laughs> no matter how much i get roasted about it for the way i talk or that uh that i'm not as i'm not as hispanic as i should be and at the end of the day it's like well but i am so i don't know why i sound like a california surfer half the time but that's how that, that, that's just how it is <laughs> i don't know that's that's what it is growing up in Vegas. You don't get to pick your accent. It just kind of just comes out no matter how. Like I've met some Vegas people that grew up in Vegas their whole life, but they sound like an East Coast person. It's that's true. it's it's that's really true. interesting. There's a lady like that at the airport at the restaurant, some little restaurant at the airport. I swear she comes from Long Island, but she doesn't. She's born and raised here. What the hell? How what are you doing? <laughs> Just Vegas exactly. people have to import their accent, just like. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do you do voices, impressions? Do you? What else? Do you like have any act? Do you do a lot of act? At, what's your comedy like? I've got to get out and catch your act. Um, I would say it's pretty much the what what you saw over at uh at the Cougarlicious Club. I'm I'm very I'm very uh. I'm very animated. I talk a lot. I talk a lot with my hands mostly. I uh, I basically try to come off as uh, that I'm I'm the dumbest. I'm the dumbest, happiest person in the crowd, <laughs> if, and I try to make myself the butt of the joke as that as much as a, as much as I can, uh, while also hopefully just showing people that that hey, but this dumb this dumb thing that I think you guys have thought about it before. You guys <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. I like that. Uh, but yeah, I do like to get as anime as I could be. Uh I not on stage, but I, I do like doing accents. I the, the, they're my personal inner inner bit is just just uh talk talking out loud in accents that I have no business doing, even if I'm not good at them. I they're so entertaining. I do it with my girlfriend. It's it's a it's a really good time. I do one accent, one impression. It's of my dad because I feel safe that nobody can tell me it's a bad impression. <laughs> <laughs> How are they going to know? You know, chances are really in my favor. <laughs> Yeah, I like to. I I do like exploring how many different uh, Hispanic accents there are. Like, cause there's 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 so many different ones, and I I I do kind of want to be able to do all of them if possible, cause they just because it makes it easier for people to know what I'm talking about when I'm referencing, like, like you know, like what what it is to like be a, a cholo and a gangster, or or like just some nerdy guy that went to college. That one's me, by the way. And, <laughs> I love that. Or, the, or those people that sell those those people that you'll see outside at the Swami just pasale, 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 pasale. mira compra mira hermano well, many good deals. It's very... You know, um, there's this gal on the internet and she does um brooklyn accents well new york accents and new york meanings so she'll take a word and she'll say you know it's impossible to understand new yorkers because every word has 15 different meanings like for instance you okay you're okay you're 
okay, you know, and she'll just break down a word and, and let you see the way she's using it, how it totally has to, you could kind of do that with your, your words, different groups and different meanings. Oh, yeah, so much. there's so much, there's so much uh, Hispanic slang both on our side of the border and over there. Cause yeah, when I, I I'm, I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, but when I go to Mexico, it just becomes a like, Okay, well, I'm not that Mexican. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of whistling evolved for this just be, for just talking. <laughs> Why? I, I have a question, and I, I hope it doesn't make me sound racist by asking it. Why do Hispanic people have to talk so fast that I can't understand them with my three months of Spanish class? Can why don't you just listen you? faster? Why don't you? <laughs> why would why is Spanish the 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 flaw? That I think you just need to pick it up. You just <laughs> it goes so fast. I'm like, could you? If you want me to eavesdrop in your conversation, you gotta talk slower. <laughs> now, uh, last last time I was in Mexico, uh, I snuck over one of my uh, one of my uh, pens for smoking weed. And uh, I have never been high over there where my parents grew up, was, was, which uh, is Michoacán, uh, Tangan, Siquero. And uh, so they're Hispanic, Hispanic. And while I was high, I could not understand anybody. <laughs> I was trying really hard, but I was just, I was just, I was just kind of like, perdón, perdón, ¿qué? ¿Qué? <laughs> and all I heard was just, <laughs> I was like, why is everyone suddenly talking Puerto Rican when you smoke weed? What is, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny like when i smoke weed it seems like all the latinos speak puerto rican <laughs> or something there's funny in that oh my goodness it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of keeping up linda there's, there's nothing i could do to, to explain <laughs> that it's, it's, it's people, just, people just don't have time to dilly dally i took german in high school and I think I got D's and F's in it, but I went to Germany in the army and, you know, I had two years of German that I failed most of the time. And I'm in Germany. I could understand what those Germans were saying behind my back. And, you know, like I, I was like, I, I understand you. I told them in German, I understand you. And I don't know, maybe they're just slow speakers or I was listening faster when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Tell people, please, Jorge, Luis, tell people where to follow you on your social medias, like the Facebook, the Instagram, all the things, and also TikTok, you know, anything, and tell people where you're going to be performing. Yeah, well, um, my Instagram handle is it's Jorge Luis Fool, uh, I T S J O R G E F O O. You can uh, find me there. I post all the time where I'm going to be going, any upcoming uh, gigs I have. And right now, uh, I'm I have a uh, I'm opening for a uh, music release party on the 23rd of August. Uh, if you look at my socials, you'll see uh, how to get information for that because it is a little bit more exclusive. You do have to uh, follow and uh, to get the info for that. That's August 23rd. Um, also, I'm going to be doing a theater pretty soon. I'm involved in a show with the Public Fit Theater here in Las Vegas for their production, uh, Native Gardens. It's just it's just going to be a stage reading, but it's a really good time to come for just seeing uh, more Latin type shows because uh, Public Fit Theater is giving more opportunities for uh, for Latin shows uh, and actors and directors to take on the reins. Um, so I'll be performing uh, Native Gardens a stage reading on the 27th and the 28th of this August as well. And uh, I'll also be doing a, a poetry reading uh, for them. They're having a, uh, not public at theater, but the Rita, the Rita, uh, the, the Rita Deneen Art Museum in Las Vegas is having a Latin poetry night. Uh, so I'll be reading the, some works from uh, more, from famous uh, poets uh, in Latin culture. Uh, so that'll be really fun for anyone. That's gonna be uh, September uh, 1st. Fabulous. Way to go. Embedding yourself in uh, poetry and opening up for a music when they're dropping music. What was that thing that you're doing for music? Uh, 
release yeah, music uh, release party wow yeah a friend of mine is have is having a music release party and he invited me to do some stand up for for the event and uh i'm always i'm always a big fan of uh, inserting myself into stuff that doesn't ask for stand up so i'm I'll, I'll do it i'll do any gig like that if the stage time is being offered absolutely some of the best gigs you can get are where there are no comics <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> find your territory take it yeah i love that well you're a delight to come on you drop some real nut nuggets of information i i'm gonna post this as highly informative about comedy tidbits so that people will watch it all the way through because you have got a lot of great knowledge you dropped Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And for, for anyone watching, uh, you know, take everything uh, I, I say with a grain of salt. It really is no singular way to do stand-up comedy other than just, just go out and just do it. Find Actually. your own rhythm. Find what works for you and just keep on doing it. The failures are just temporary. It's definitely always worth it, I feel. There you go. You heard it here, you guys. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been Jorge Luis. Thank you so much. Talk to you You're later. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye.